Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you guys? Oh, it's one of those days you kind of wake up and you really just want to go back to bed. I mean, sun's, yeah, whatever. Oh, but uh, it's going to be it's going to be amazing to be here this morning. Hopefully, it already is for you guys. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Gross. I'm one of the pastors here at Quarry, and it's a privilege to be with you, to share God's word with you, uh, to wrestle with what we're going to go through today, uh, but to know that we're in this together. If this is your first time here. A special welcome to you. Really glad that you are here with us this morning. And I pray, my prayer is that you are blessed, that you experience the greatness of God and the love of his people. So how many of you guys have ever driven along Interstate 90 or anywhere in South Dakota and, and seen these signs? <clears throat> I mean, they're everywhere. You, you, can't, you can't miss them. You see them again and again and again and again and again, over and over and over, right? The signs, they build up this anticipation for, for wild drug. And like, like when you get there, it's going to be amazing, right? Because that's what the signs say. And then you get there, and initially you're enamored, right? Because you got the 20-foot tall jackalope. And where do you see a 20-foot tall jackalope? Or the 80-foot long brontosaurus. That's super cool. And then you step into the store expecting greatness. Now, maybe wild drug for you was an amazing experience. Maybe you've never been there. You, something, something to behold, right? Right? Uh, I mean, and, and for me, just so you know, the fudge is great. The, the candy is plentiful. But then you, you walk in and the experience makes makes Walmart feel like a cathedral. I mean, like, like it's peaceful in, in Walmart, right? Because there is more product per square foot in Wild Drug than in Costco and Sam's Club combined. It's packed in. It's everywhere. And so when all was said and done for me, what I wanted was more of the signs and less of Wild Drug. I, 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 could, I could take the signs, but I didn't need to go back to Wall, South Dakota. Now, as we continue to walk through John's gospel, one, one of the themes that emerges is the desire of men and women to witness the signs of Christ. More, more than witness, they actually want to be the beneficiaries of the signs, uh, of healings, of special blessings, of, of being the first, of being the greatest. It seems that people were more interested in the signs that Christ produces than the person of Jesus. Now, don't misunderstand me. The signs are important. They, they point us to Jesus. And John is using those signs and, and miracles to fulfill his main goal, that people might believe in Jesus, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, they would have life in his name. That's the hope. Remember, after the miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding of Cana, John says, Jesus did this as the first of his miraculous signs. In this way, he revealed his glory, and the disciples believed in him. The signs lead to believing. And then we talked about this last week. After he drove the money changers out of the temple, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. And then John adds this comment. His disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the signs lead to believing. So John really is on task. He is writing with a view to helping people see the glory of the Son of God, to experience His grace, and, and then in that grace to believe, and, and, and through that belief, to enter into life, real life. So it's kind of in that context That we read the passage for today, and, uh, and honestly, it's a bit unsettling. It's a bit unnerving. It stirs me. Because what it says, in essence, is that Jesus knows what is in every heart. And so he can see when, when someone truly believes, and he can see the difference between someone who truly believes and someone who says they truly believe, but is just offering up lip service. They don't really believe. See, Jesus' ability to perfectly know the substance of every heart leads to the unsettling truth that some belief is not the kind of belief that obtains fellowship, that, that leads to the goal of being in relationship 
with God that leads to eternal life. Some belief is not saving belief. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open up with me to John, uh, the Gospel of John. We're going to look at the second chapter, the very end of the second chapter, and actually the beginning of the third chapter, starting with John 23. And just, just a word about this. So, so we go to Scripture, uh, yes, because we're a church, we're a Christian church, and these are our holy Scriptures, but the, the book that we go to is, is faithful and true. We keep going back there because it's been proven to be effective o- over time. We, we keep going back to Scripture because it is the most historically accurate book in all of history. We keep going back to Scripture because it is more than just wisdom. Because in the book is life. There is life in the gospel of Jesus. So John 2.23 Now, while Jesus was in Jerusalem at the feast of the Passover, it's kind of where we left him last week, many people believed in his name because they saw the miraculous signs he was doing. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. He did not need anyone to testify about man, for he knew what was in man. Now, a certain man, a Pharisee named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council, came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the miraculous signs that you do unless God is with him. We're going to dig into that. Before we do, let's pray together and invite God into this time. Please bow your heads. Gracious God, we adore you. You are the creator of all things. You are the giver of all of life. You are our sustainer. You are our hope. You, in a very real way, more than I think we understand, are all that we need. You are everything to us. And so, God, in this moment, help us to to cherish what it is to be in your presence and to long for your presence more than we long for your signs. Meet with us today. Open up our hearts and minds, God, to what we need in this moment so that you may be glorified even more. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so there are, there are two things I want to focus on uh, this morning. First, as John, as John is teaching us, I want us to focus on uh, where he's leading us because he always wants us to see the glory of Jesus the glory of Christ. And he points out the glory of Christ by pointing out the omniscience of Jesus. Omniscience. Jesus has the ability to know all things. Omni, all. He knows all things. He's all-knowing or omniscient. And the second is the discovery that there is this kind of belief, kind of faith in Jesus that he does not approve, that he does not accept, that he's not saving. That's the unsettling part. So first, let's focus on how John reveals the glory of Christ in his omniscience. Now re- remember, we are, we are being guided by, by verses uh, uh, 14 and 16 of chapter 1. We read, now, now the Word became flesh and took up residence among us. We saw his glory. This is John. We saw his glory and the glory, the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth, who came from the Father. For we have all received from his fullness one gracious gift after another. When we, receive, when we see the glory, when we experience the glory, we receive the grace. And this is where John is leading us. So where's the glory? Let's find the glory. We see the glory of the Son of God at the end of verse 24 and in all of verse 25. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. He didn't need anyone to testify about man, for he knew what was in man. And so there's, there's three statements, powerful statements, packed statements. First is, is this general statement in John, 20, John 2, 24, that he knew all people, kind of all-encompassing. He knew all people. Second, if we get a little more specific, 
It gets personal. Not just all people generally, but he himself knew what was in man, what was in you, and what's in me. And then the implication of that verse, I mean, he didn't need anyone to testify about man. He didn't need anybody to tell them, tell him about man, who was good, who was not good, who was right, who was not right, who believed and who didn't believe, because he knew what was in man. So Jesus knows all about all people. No person is excluded from his knowledge, and no part of our life is excluded from his knowing. He, he knows everybody and everything about everybody. Here's what he'll say a little bit later on in chapter 6. He says, but there are some who do not believe. And John adds this comment, for Jesus had already known from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he's talking specifically about the heart of the betrayer, the, the man named Judas, who would sell his location for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus wasn't surprised because he knows the heart of every man. And it's, it's my hope that, that, that this, this truth really sinks deep into who you are. I mean, because if you've ever been impressed about anyone's knowledge or, or, or a person's wisdom, if any character in fiction or, or maybe a person in history or, or, or a scholar that you look to and you go, wow, that person. The knowledge that Jesus holds should be infinitely more impressive to us because he knows all things. He knows the heart of every person. It means that there are no complete secrets in your life. I mean, you may have succeeded in, in hiding something all of your life from everyone on this earth, but you haven't hidden it from Jesus. He knows. The person who matters most knows most. The person whose judgment about you is all important. He really does know all. Let that sink in. You are totally, completely known. There is not the slightest part of your heart unknown to Jesus, now and always. That means that there is at least one person that you must relate to who knows everything about you. I mean, you may be able to look at others in the face and know that they don't know certain things about you, right? And it shapes your relationship. It shapes how you appear to the rest of the world. But there is one who, when you look at him in the face, he sees totally through you, deep inside you. And if you relate to him at all, you relate as one utterly exposed, totally known, what an amazing freedom there is in that. There is one and only one who knows all of you. Nobody else even comes close. I mean, your spouse's knowledge of you, your best friend's knowledge of you, compares to Jesus' knowledge of you like first grade math compares to quantum mechanics. Night and day, you are fully known by one person. His name is Jesus. Therefore, you, all, you, have, you have someone who is always there to go to for help in knowing you. I mean, this is, this is one of the, the, the deep questions that we have as people is who are we? What, what makes me tick? What is true about me? What is my nature? Why, what, 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 is the, what is the deepest part of me? Why do I think the way I think? There's one who knows the complete answer to all these questions, Jesus. Do you remember, you remember Peter, uh, this is shortly after, after uh, Jesus came, came back and was with his disciples, and Jesus asks him the same question, one of his closest disciples, Jesus asks him the same question three different times, do you love me? Probably because Peter denied Jesus three different times, and so, so there's healing in this. And Peter, Peter said the first time, yes, Lord, you know, you know that I love you. 
And so the second time, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know that I love you. The third time, Lord, you know everything. You know everything. You know I love you. There is always one person who knows your heart perfectly, knows it better than you do. That's Jesus. And he still pursues you. So so we said there's two things we're going to focus on today. The the first is the glory of of Jesus' omniscience. The second is this this discovery that that there is a kind of faith in Jesus that he does not approve. This is the implication of his omniscience that John focuses on. He draws out the implication that when Jesus looks into the hearts of those who believed, that he saw something other than the kind of faith that makes you a child of God. Remember, John 1.12 says, But to all who receive him, who believe in his name, he's given the right to become children of God. And here in in verse 23 of chapter 2, it says that many people believed in his name because they saw the miraculous signs he was doing. And it seems that in this moment that Jesus should be thrilled about this. But he's not thrilled Verse 24 says, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them. He wouldn't give himself to them because he knew all people. Now, this isn't the way that he treats his own sheep, who who he calls by name, his own disciples. See, when Jesus withholds himself from them by not entrusting himself to them, he is saying that they are believing in a way that is not saving to them. They are not children of God. They are not doing John 1, 12. Whatever their, whatever their faith is, Jesus does not approve. But John is still on task. Remember, the aim of his gospel is that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so it's crucial that John clarify that not all faith looks looks like the kind of faith necessary for life with God. While this is unsettling to us, unnerving to us, it's absolutely necessary for us. For for Jesus to point this out and to help us come to terms now rather than later when it might be too late. So, So what's wrong with their faith? Right, these who believe, what's wrong with their belief? Well, there are some clues here. And and first, it's it's a reference to to signs. And Jesus says a lot about signs later on. The the second clue is this incident mentioned as an introduction to the story of a man named Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus, uh, we're going to talk more about him next week. I mean, at, at, at one level, he, he's a historic man, and he has a dialogue with Jesus at another level. And remember, this is the way John writes. He really represents the people who believe in one sense, but not in the way that Jesus approves. So let's talk about Nicodemus first. And I, and I want to uh, help you understand, so we have a chapter division there, and it seems like the chapter comes to a conclusion, and then we begin something new. Uh, but when, when the Bible was originally written, there were no chapter, there were no chapter and verse designations. And, and we think that, that actually we got this one wrong, that chapter 2 and 3, the end of chapter 2 and 3, are actually should, should go closely together. So, so uh, verse 25 ends, we read, For he, and a he there is Jesus, knew what was in man. And then the next verse says, Now a certain man, so we're we're continuing on. Now a certain man, kind of like the man we just talked about, a Pharisee named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council, came to Jesus at night in darkness, not in light, in darkness, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs that you do unless God is with him. And, And I think this is the kind of faith Jesus sees in the people 
We know that you are a teacher who is, who's come from God, for, for no one can perform the miraculous signs that you do unless God is with him. This is a great statement of faith. It's what some pious Jews actually believe about Jesus. It's what Muslims believe about Jesus. It's a very high view of Jesus. He is from God. God is with him. What he does are signs of God's power in him. This is a significant faith. But it's not a saving faith. See, Nicodemus was not born again. That's the point of the rest of the story. Nicodemus, with all his faith, with all his training, with all his knowledge, needed to be born again, born anew, born fresh. See, Nicodemus has no spiritual life. He's still spiritually blind. He didn't didn't see through the signs of glory to the only Son of God. He only saw the signs, and they were so impressive that the natural mind drew drew him to the conclusion that they must involve God. Notice the reference to signs in verse 23. the, the, The second clue about what's wrong with the faith of those referenced in that verse. Many people believed in his name because they saw the miraculous signs he was doing. They believed when they saw the signs. These signs that were meant to point people to the true Son of God and what He stood for. But many saw the signs, amazed at the signs. But they didn't see what they pointed to. They didn't see what they stood for. Jesus' brothers, His own brothers, are a great example of this. This is John chapter 7. So so we read this. So Jesus' brothers advised him, leave here, leave where you are, and go to Judea so your disciples may see your miracles that you're performing. Essentially, your stage is too small here, Jesus. For no one who seeks to make a reputation for himself does anything in secret. If you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. And then uh, John gives us, this uh, parenthetical statement, for, for not even his own brothers believed in him. This is, this is, really, this is unbelievable. I want, I want you to kind of catch the scene. Jesus' brothers are coaching him on how to be rich and famous, how to, how to make it big, how to, how to go big. Like, like, that's the goal. If you want to go big, Jesus, this is how you do it. All right, you got you to get out of, out of this little pond and go to a much bigger pool. See, they were clueless about who Jesus really was. And they loved the signs, but they did not believe in him. They knew he worked miracles. They believed that. They were excited about that, and they wanted him to go public and get the ten- attention that he deserved. But John says that that's unbelief. In chapter 5, verse 44. It says, how can you believe if you accept praise from one another and don't seek the praise that comes from the only God? Seeking praise from one another rather than the glory of God, the greatness of God, the love of God. See, deep down inside, where where Jesus could see and no one else could, his brothers loved the glory of man, the adoration of those around them. And they saw Jesus, this this miracle worker, their brother, as their chance to taste some of their own glory. And they're going to ride on his coattails and and feast on the glory of man. But real, saving faith in Jesus is, is a humble thing. It's what broken people do. People who know they're broken. Not what power lovers or, or popularity lovers or, or sign and wonders lovers do. See, being a sign seeker is a dangerous condition. So, so many of us today, we run from one set of sign, signs and wonders to the next, kind of craving the spectacular. We follow the latest sign workers and, 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 until he leaves his wife or until she flies off with all the money, with everyone's hope. 
And Jesus is a warning against this. He said in, in Matthew 24, For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. They will do real signs. They'll be amazing, stunning miracles. And what will the sign seekers do then? What do we do then? They, they will fall away from following Christ. But, but didn't they have faith? Kind of. But not a saving faith. This is what Jesus is warning us against here. For our own souls. Let's let the Apostle Paul have the last word today. He describes the end times when it all comes to a conclusion in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We read this, The arrival of the lawless one will be by Satan's working with all kinds of miracles and signs and false wonders and with every kind of evil deception directed against those who are perishing because they found no place in their hearts for the truth so as to be saved. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So there will be signs and wonders in the last days before Jesus comes back, and they will be real, and they will be lying, full of deception. And many who profess faith in Christ, a, a, a kind of faith, an unreal faith, a faith that does not love the truth, a, a faith that does not save, will switch their faith in Jesus, the sign worker, and that's, that's how some view him, to another sign worker who seems even more impressive, and they will perish. And so the issue today is this. Is your faith, is your belief based on spiritual sight of the glory of the one and only Son from the Father full of grace and truth? Is your faith based on the greatness and wonder of Jesus? Do you see Christ and His cross as compellingly glorious? Or are you only attracted to signs and wonders? Let me close with, with one word about the cross of Christ, the death of Christ. Because you, you, you would think that a man who can see perfectly into the heart of every soul and know every, what everyone is thinking and feeling and planning now and always, that you would think that such a man could move through life by avoiding anything painful, anything, anything dangerous. He can simply see all thoughts of malice and intent and just kind of walk through, just out of reach. And that's true. He could. Jesus could. If that was his plan. But it wasn't Jesus' plan. He knew what was in the heart of man. He knows what's in your heart and so he chose when and where and how and why he would die. And he did it all for you. He did it for me. If you see him on his cross as the greatest glory and believe on him, then, then the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, that that. that John the Baptist talks about really will be the Lamb of God who takes away your sin. That you may have eternal life with Him. It is not the signs and wonders. It is the very presence of God that we so desire. So I exhort you to embrace the one to whom all the signs point. Embrace the one who knows the substance of every heart, the substance of your heart. Believe in your heart that Jesus is God and receive the grace that he lavishes on you. John is making it crystal clear that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is 
our glorious Savior. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, (laughs) great and glorious God, the one who knows the heart of all men and women and children, all people, who sees through the facade to the substance of who we are. And yet you love us. God, the truth is, and this is why we keep going back to Scripture, to just bathe ourselves in truth, is that while we were still sinners, you loved us. There is nothing that would keep us from you. You continue to pursue us. There's nothing we could have done that is so bad that you say, okay, you're out. There's no coming back for you. You continue to pursue. And the cross and your death, your blood cover all of our sins. Forgive us, Father. When we pursue the signs instead of you. When we pursue our own well-being instead of your presence. When we pursue safety rather than your holiness. Forgive us, Father. And Lord, in the power of your Spirit, Grow our faith, faith in the one and only Son of God, who died the death we deserve, who rose again in power, who offers us grace. May we see your glory, and in the seeing, receive your grace. May our goal, Lord, above all things, be your person. Meet us here. In these next moments as we worship, meet us here. We praise you, God, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.